Within two weeks of launching, I was making six figures as a creative person. I didn't change my videos, I didn't change my music. I just put up a Patreon page. And other creators saw that, you know, I'm not PewDiePie. I'm not like top of the pack here. I'm like a middle of the road, bald YouTuber. Jack Conte wasn't some starving artist eking out a living when he landed on the idea for Patreon. In fact, he and his wife's indie band called Pomplamoose was pulling in about $400,000 a year at its height. They had branded merch and MP3s, toured the country, building a dedicated fan base. And they even had employees with health benefits in a 401k match. It still does. But after spending three months and maxing out his credit cards to produce an intricate music video for the song Pedals, Jack found himself burned out, sitting alone, literally crying from exhaustion. And I sat there in a puddle of bottled water crying like a baby. And it was so dumb. Even though that video would go on to rack up millions of views, he knew that the amount of money it would generate would pale in comparison to the effort he put into creating it. He felt there had to be a better way for creators to get paid for their work. There are three numbers to look out for in this story. 10,000, the amount Jack spent on the Pedals music video, Three, the number of creators who signed up for Patreon at its launch, and 400 million, the total outside investment the company has raised so far. Today, Jack and his co-founder Sam Yam are weighing the cost benefit of taking the company public. That, okay, so here we go. Here's how Jack Conte and his co-founder Sam Yam built Patreon. For CNBC Make It, I'm Nate Skid. This is Founder Effect. Jack grew up in Marin County watching Wallace and Gromit stop motion cartoons and dabbling in the arts from jazz and acapella to video production. He was eventually accepted to Stanford where he started down the STEM path. I don't think I've ever talked about this, but I just remembered my college essay. You know how you have to write like an essay to, to colleges? I wrote my college essay about a clay animation that I made. But while his head was in STEM, his heart was in the arts, so he switched his major to music. His freshman roommate was another young aspiring musician, Sam Yam. I ended up even going uh, and performing in Carnegie Hall. After graduating with a degree in 2006, his parents were excited to hear about his plans for grad school. There was just one problem. I wasn't going to get a master's. I wasn't going to enter the workforce. Instead, I was going to be in a pop band. That was the tough conversation with my parents. What was that conversation really like when you told them? I mean, was there, did they give you like an ultimatum or anything like that? Were there tears? We sat down in the kitchen at 3 p.m. And I sat down at the table and my mom said to me, Jack, you can tell me whatever you want in the whole world. You can tell me anything you want as long as you tell me you're still going to grad school. <laughs> Jack told his parents about his plan to make music for a living. And his dad gave him some tough love advice. Look, Jack. I know you like to play piano, and I know you like to sing, but you're no Mel Torme, is what he said to me. <laughs> and um, I mean, he's not wrong. Jack and his soon-to-be wife, Natalie Dawn, formed Pomplamoose in 2008 and slowly began building a business out of their music. But there were two seminal moments that led him to the idea for a platform that connected creatives to their audiences in a financial way. The first came from a video Pomplamoose posted on its YouTube channel promoting a book drive for the Richmond School District in the East Bay. 11,000 Amazon packages arrived at the school from Pomplamoose fans. It's like $140,000 worth of books. And I look up from something like that as a creative person and I'm like, damn. But in 2013, he drained his savings, maxed out two credit cards, and spent months producing a music video for that song, Pedals. At the end of the process, when we filmed the final shot, I literally collapsed, knocked over a bottle of water. And so it just fell over and just pooled all over my lap. And I sat there in a puddle of bottled water crying like a baby. And it was so dumb. The inequity between the effort required to produce high-end creative content and the revenue generated from it was stark. My ad revenue to this day on that video is less than $1,000. And it has two and a half million views and thousands and thousands of comments. Right before I post this video is when I started realizing something isn't adding up here. I put in so much work to this thing and it's going to reach a lot of people, but I'm not going to be paid for it. And that was when I sketched out the idea for Patreon on 14 pieces of printer paper and, uh, and called up Sam. Everything I've read, this is a little bit loose in, in, in the, the history of Patreon. Is like, how did you, did you guys keep in touch the whole time? And like, we're gonna figure something out to work together? Or were you just like, Sam's the smartest guy I know. 
we got to get this figured out. It, it was a little bit of both. And I was like, no, no, I want to, I want to pitch you this vision. Like I've, I've got to meet in person. And, and I also, and I want you to sign an NDA first. I yeah. asked you to sign an NDA. <laughs> I'm a freaking creator. I'm not a business builder, I'm not an entrepreneur. And what you told me was, Jack, don't worry about NDAs. Ideas are cheap. It's all about execution. Everybody's got ideas. What matters is making the idea come true. So don't worry about telling people your idea. Nobody's gonna like care. That's what I, you, yeah, that's what you I, said. I literally said, nobody's gonna care about your idea. You can just tell me and, and I'll give you that feedback. And then you what came happened? and you pitched this idea. And I was like, Jack, don't tell anyone. We, no one else, can, this is brilliant. We're, we're gonna get started now. We like did that agreement through email and then we went off with it. What do you guys do next? Did you spend Pomplamoose money to get this off the ground? Did you like just bootstrap it yourselves? Uh, we didn't have any money. I had no money. I had spent all my money on this freaking robot music video. So we weren't spending money. We were just trying to figure out how to get this thing out there. I wasn't paying Sam. Like we agreed to go in this together as partners. And I sent Sam an email. We didn't even use a lawyer. We didn't incorporate. We didn't. We didn't do freaking legal Zoom. We did nothing. I sent Sam an email and I was like, Sam, let's build this thing. Here's the rough agreement. Do you kind of agree to this roughly? And he was like, yes, I do. Let's go. And then we we went. Um, so there was no infrastructure. There was no strategy. There was no business plan. There was no deck. There was no TAM analysis. There was no market sizing. We had to buy the website, which, um, we did and it was like 10 bucks <laughs> and um and then i think you know sammy you had to you had to spin up some services to kind of get the thing off the ground but that was minimal cost because we had no traffic um but uh but that changed actually when we when we launched it got it got pretty pretty big pretty quickly Jack scoured youtube for creators he thought could benefit from patreon's model and built a spreadsheet of names he reached out to 40 of them and 40 out of 40 said no. And we ended up launching with just me and my girlfriend and our roommate. The but is I had a feeling that when this came out and people saw it working, they would change their minds. What date do you did you go live with your content on Patreon? May 7th, 2013. Here's how Patreon works. Creators sign up for one of three tiers of service that cost five, eight, or 12% of the revenue they generate, depending on the services they require. YouTube takes 45% of ad revenue. It stems from a different philosophy of the world, right? It's like, it's not just accidental that those pricing philosophies are, there's such a gap in those. Our purpose in the world is to pay creative people. And so we're trying to build a system in which creators can take home almost everything, right? Once creators saw how effective Patreon was at helping them make money, interest in the platform grew exponentially. Within two weeks of launching, I was making six figures as a creative person. Like within two weeks of putting up a Patreon, I didn't change my videos, I didn't change my music, I didn't change my anything. I just put up a Patreon page. And other creators saw that, you know, I'm not PewDiePie, uh, you know, I'm not like top of the pack here. I'm like a middle of the road, bald YouTuber. Over a thousand people signed up the day Patreon went live. Patreon's operation quickly outgrew their ability to manage it. So they set out to raise $700,000 in their first round of outside investment. It didn't go well. It wasn't until I went in and I literally just pitched the robot music video story. I just went and I showed them pictures of the Millennium Falcon. I was like, I built this with my bare hands. It took me three months. I worked 19 hour days and it got millions of views and I got paid $200 and that's, and we have to fix that. But it wasn't until I was really kind of able to just be myself, I think, that people saw that like there was a real problem here that a real person was having and that Sam and I were the right team to solve that problem. Freestyle Capital took the whole $700,000, then the floodgates opened up. I want to put in the full amount. And so that filled up the round immediately. And we had already been in touch with a few other investors who were still kind of on the fence. And once we told them that the round was closed, we filled up the full 700,000. They ended up raising over $2 million in their first round, which came in handy. It was time to scale, but there were too many threads to pull at once. Their first hire handled operations and he built out everything from human resources to creator partnerships and payroll. 
Next came engineers and tech support. For many months, Sam was the only engineer. Uh, and so, you know, when we launched, I think a lot of folks don't know this, we launched even before we had, before Sam had written payments. We launched on May 7th, payments was not written yet. So Sam had 23 days to write payments before the first of the month when we charged credit cards. I mean, that's kind of crazy that you guys launched before you could do the thing you were trying to sell that you could do, right? Hey, uh, we want to be able to get this idea. We were so excited um, in front of people as, as quickly as possible. And, uh, and, and we did, we put it out in front of there. We hadn't done the actual processing of taking that money. One of the first things users asked for was to be able to use PayPal, but the team hadn't automated payments yet, which meant they spent countless hours manually approving thousands and thousands of payments. I think it took us like over a year, right, Jack, before we had even sent a million dollars. We put that whole big poster up and, and we, were, we were celebrating it. And in, in retrospect now, you, you look at us being able to send over like three billion now to creators, like the scale on which a lot of this has, has grown has been extremely rapid. But even at that time, it felt like things were growing quite quickly. Patreon has put up some truly impressive numbers. So far, it has sent over three and a half billion dollars to creatives. And there are over 250,000 creators on the site generating recurring revenue, some of which are pulling in up to $10 million a year with 40 employees, and they even have office space. I think the long-term trend here is there are now hundreds of millions of creative people around the world. You, you know, creation tools like this phone that we all have in our pockets, right? There are billions of these and they take better videos than the cameras used to film some of my favorite movies ever created. We have the distribution figured out. We have the creation tools that are cheap and ubiquitous. The last thing is the business infrastructure required to help creative people build real, sustainable, awesome businesses from their work. That's the last leg of the school. But growth at that scale comes with costs and incredibly different decisions that have to be made. Jack and Sam say they're debating right now whether or not to go public. How much total investment have you guys gotten so far? It's, it's a little over 400 million in the total that Patreon has raised since the beginning of the company. Jesus Christ, why not go public? I, so, the the sort of the the plan for patreon here what i want for the company and what matters to me i want there to be a company in the world that looks at the world through the eyes of a creator and solves problems for creative people mm, how does that work with shareholder uh like shareholders coming first because like it, it can't be both that is my job and that is the hard part of the job. Here's what I believe. I believe the thing that is best for creative people is best for shareholders of the long run. And they may not know that, but our ability to trade for creators, right? Our ability to always do what is in a creator's best interests over the long run. I believe that the companies that do that well are the companies who build the most value and the companies who do the best for shareholders and the company who do the best in the market. Now there's a second component of it, which is the design of our business model. We don't get paid unless creators are successful. What that essentially means is we don't have to choose between people and profit. I don't know, man. I, 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 this is where I get where I get iffy is that like, I believe in you because you had the experience of spending your $10,000. So that's in your heart. Shareholder interest is, would they pay six, nine and 13%? How, how far could we get them to go while they would still see value over us over somebody different? You ask a really good question and I don't want to brush it off for sound bites because it, 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 is, it is the core, I believe, of my job. And it's hard. And I, I guess I just want to acknowledge that there isn't a silver bullet solution here. The thing that I have learned ab about this is that it, it's everything that you do. It's the people you hire. It's the investors you bring on. It's the way you start all hands. It's the messages that you send to the team. It's how I write and how I speak. It's who we hire and who we promote. It's who we let go. It's our systems and processes in internally. Everything has to bleed that creator first mindset. 
everything has to reinforce that the company exists to do right by creators over the coming decades. Everything that we do in the company has to bring that into the foreground and be in a spotlight at the company. And any slippage on that is scary AF for me, right? Like I want to build a system where we are thinking about creators all the time and they're at the top of our minds. And I'm not gonna pretend like that isn't hard. There's always a, a risk that the company shifts in balance. And that's a risk that I think we've seen play out with lots of other companies. I don't want that to play out at Patreon. And that's why it's like the top thing on my mind every morning when I get out of bed. So I, I guess I just wanna acknowledge the, the critical importance of that question that you asked. It's the right question. And it's the thing that I, that I keep in the front of my brain.